So good morning everyone. This is uh, our lecture 10.1 in our group theory course. It's the first lecture on chapter 10. Chapter 10. Uh, in, in chapter 10 we will discuss about uh, space groups in reciprocal space. Um, in the previous chapter, chapter 9, we discussed uh, space groups in, in real space and crystallography mostly. <clears throat> but in chapter 10, we will see how, our, how, how can we use group theory <clears throat> uh, in, in reciprocal space and analyze the symmetry properties of, of uh, Bloch functions. And, and, and uh, we start by reviewing some of the basic aspects of of the block theorem and and uh, the definitions of a reciprocal lattice this is a very basic um, uh, review i i assume that most of you have seen this content in uh, in undergraduate solid state courses but uh, just in case i'm going to briefly briefly review that uh, the book, our book also has a, a small introduction of uh, of these concepts. But uh, let's let's start from Bloch's theorem. <coughs> so uh, we are interested in finding the form of uh, a wave function which is a solution of the Schrodinger equation for an electron in a periodic potential. So we start from a single electron Schrodinger equation. You have the kinetic energy, you have the potential energy, and the, you, we, you, we assume that we have a periodic potential in the sense that when I translate the, the position R by a certain vector that we call the lattice vector or Bravais lattice vector, then the potential uh, remains invariant. So the potential is invariant under translation symmetry for a specific set of vectors, which are the lattice vectors. Okay, so how can we solve this problem? How can we see what is the the form of the wave function for the eigenfunction for this Hamiltonian. Well, let us remember a simpler problem, which is the free electron problem. In this case, u equals to zero or a constant. And if you remember from basic quantum mechanics, uh, for a free electron, we know the, the solutions. We know the the wave functions are just plane waves, right? So these are a plane wave uh, normalized for finding the probability of one of finding the electron in a certain box of volume V. And you can see that the wave function is just a plane wave which is characterized by a single quantum number K which is the wave vector of the electron, okay? So, <clears throat> so why the wave function has this particular form for the free electron? One way to see that is that this, is re this results from the fact that the free space has complete translation invariance. It has complete translation symmetry. So for this reason, the... Uh, <coughs> I, the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, they, they must be simultaneous eigenfunctions of both Hamiltonian and the translation operator, okay? And it's easy to show that this is an eigenfunction of the translation operator. So let's see uh, how we can show that. First of all, let, let, uh, let me remind you of, of, of what the translation operator is. The translation operator operator t r prime basically takes a function f of r and translates it by r prime. So it takes a function f of r and translates it to f of r plus r prime. Okay? 
Okay, this is a translation operator. And indeed, you can see that this particular form of the wave function is an eigenfunction of the translation operator. So if you apply the translation operator to a plane wave, the result is a, the plane wave at a, a, a translated uh, position, which is simply like that. And you can see that I recovered the same plane wave, but just multiplied by a phase factor e to the i k dot r prime so trans the, the wave function the plane wave wave function is uh, a, an eigenfunction of the translation operator and the eigenvalue is precisely this phase factor okay for any r prime that we may consider so this is interesting because this is suggesting us that we can apply the same or a similar argument for the case in which we don't have more uh, a free electron anymore but now we have <coughs> a periodic potential and what is the difference between the two <coughs> well so the effect of a, a crystal potential is indeed actually to break the complete translation invariance of space okay so now I have a lattice with uh, some lattice points and lattice vectors. And I don't have any more complete translation invariance, but a particular subset of translation invariance remains. And those are precisely the ones defined by the lattice vectors R, big R. So uh, I don't have Transla complete translation or invariance anymore, but I have a, a translation invariance for a set of discrete uh, vectors, which are precisely the lattice vectors. But then, in this case, we can say that the Hamiltonian will commute <coughs> only with this <coughs> a subset of translation vectors, T of R, big R, in which R is a lattice vector. But if this is the case, we can just go ahead and use the same argument as before. We expect that when we apply the translation operator to psi k, I, uh, I have a translated um, wave function, and <coughs> it should be a, a eigenfunction of the translation operator, and the eigenvalue is the same, e to the i k dot big r okay so this is just i just use the same result as the free electron but restricted to this particular set of uh, lattice vectors and this is nothing else than the the bloch's theorem this is bloch's theorem bloch's theorem says that uh, when i translate a wave function of an electron in a periodic potential by a lattice vector it acquires a phase and this phase is e to the i k dot r so Bloch's theorem is just uh, a consequence of this translational symmetry of uh, the space for for lattice vectors okay so <coughs> There are many things we, con we can conclude from, from that. One thing is that, notice that the wave function does not have lattice periodicity. So the wave function is not periodic, although the potential is periodic. So I recover the same potential when I translate by R, but I don't recover the same wave function when I translate by R. I recover the, the, the wave function gets multiplied by a phase factor. So notice then that the wave function does not have lattice periodicity. <coughs> All right, there, there's another form of Bloch's theorem which is equivalent to, to this one, which is the following. We can write the wave function of, of an electron in a periodic potential in this fashion. It is a plane wave multiplied by a periodic function uk of r this is also called the periodic part 
of the, the blocks function. So u is a periodic function, you can see it right here, but it's just one part <coughs> of the wave function. So the wave function is, is, multi, is a product of the periodic part and a plane wave part. Okay? You can see that in this picture, pictorically, uh, you can see that this uh, long wavelength oscillation it plays the role of this plane wave part. And on top of that, or multiplied by that, I have this uh, short range oscillating like atomic orbital, like periodic function. You see that this is a periodic function. This is a lattice point, a lattice point, and it gets multiplied by the 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 plane wave part so this the the the, the product of both of them is the the blocks function is the wave function of the electron in a periodic potential okay and i can also prove that both statements of the block theorem are equivalent equivalent so i can do that just by calculating what uh, psi of r plus big R is using this form. So I just write uh, instead of r, I, I, I write r plus uh, lattice vector, r big R. Uh, but this is a periodic function, so this is just u of r. And, and this I can factor, factorize, and in the end you can see that this is just psi k of r. So, indeed, so we recover the first uh, form of the block theorem. When I translate the wave function by a lattice vector, I recover the same wave function multiplied by a phase vector. Okay, so the, both, both statements of block theorem are equivalent to each other. Okay, so this is block theorem as a review of that. So what about reciprocal space? What is reciprocal space? Well, <clears throat> let's start again from, from the blocks function. And let's say we want to do a Fourier expansion of the periodic part u of r. Okay? If this was a general function, then we know from from from, from mathematical physics that you can always write a, a a certain function in an expansion, Fourier expansion like that, okay, uh, in which I have an integral over several different uh, wave vectors and plane waves multiplied by this the Fourier transform. This is a general expression for Fourier expansion, okay. But in this case, we have a, a special situation that u is not the general function but it's a periodic function so and we we have learned this already from uh basic physics when i have a periodic function let's say i have a sawtooth function like that and uh and i want to expand this in different harmonics you have the first harmonic the second harmonic the third harmonic we do that when we study waves and 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 and, and sound sound waves, uh, and we learn that the the not all sines and cosines for any frequency will contribute to the Fourier expansion of this periodic function. Only those sines and cosines will have with frequencies or spatial frequencies in our case which are multiple of a certain uh, a fundamental mode will participate in the Fourier expansion of a periodic system. We have uh, uh, the first harmonic, the second harmonic, and so on and so forth. And the same thing happens uh, in this particular case. In the case of a periodic function in space, only a discrete set of wave vectors that we call g vectors only for k equals to g only those 
plain ways will contribute to the expansion, to the Fourier ex expansion of U, right? Uh, for example, and let's take this one, one D case, it's easy to see. For a 1D crystal with a lattice constant A, only the wave uh, vectors G, G of N, which are multiple of, a, of 2 pi over A, will contribute to the expansion of this periodic function in plane waves. Right? And the reason is that if the wave function, if, if the, the, this function is periodic, only sines and cosines with the same periodicity will be able to uh, contribute to its Fourier expansion. All right? So only a discrete set of wave vectors that we call G, or G of N. So this discrete set of Gs we call a reciprocal lattice. All right? So this is a, the def definition of a reciprocal lattice. So again, going back to our, to our uh, uh, one-dimensional example, uh, this is a Brevet lattice in one dimension. It's just a line of points separated by the lattice constant that we call A. And the set of vectors that we have discussed, the G vectors, they also form a set of points, but not in a real space, X, but in the reciprocal space, or so-called K space. And instead of being separated by the lattice constant A, they are separated by 2 pi over A, which is actually the lattice constant of reciprocal lattice. All right? So... The reciprocal lattice is just a Brevet lattice in, in K space, in reciprocal space. And this in this one dimensional case, this is fairly easy to to, to conclude. But when you we go to to three dimensions, the same uh, result applies. So the associated to any given Brevet lattice in real space there is a reciprocal lattice which uh, fulfills this, the same condition. It's the set of wave vectors which have plane waves that have the same periodicity of the Brevet lattice. As an example, uh, the reciprocal lattice of the FCC lattice is the BCC lattice, but one is in the real space and the other one is in reciprocal space. Okay, so this was a, a short <clears throat> introduction to, to Bloch's theorem and uh, reciprocal space. So let's go ahead now and uh, 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 start chapter 10. Uh, again, in chapter 10, there is also a, a, a short discussion on the main results that we are going to use uh, for applying for the application of group theory to 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 the to this uh, to reciprocal space and blocks function and let me also discuss some of those results and and uh, if we start from a, a periodic if we start from the blocks function form psi k of r is a, has a plane wave part and a periodic part and we can as I said we can expand the periodic part in a discrete set of plane waves with uh, wave vectors g and some coefic coefficients c of g e to the minus e minus i g dot r right 
and let's say if, if this is a periodic function I know that this must be equal to u of r but on the other hand when I explicitly write r plus big r here what I get is the following r plus big r right and I know that this must be equal to u of r so as a result this is equal to 1 this is equal to 1 this is another way of defining the uh, reciprocal lattice vectors G are, these are the vectors that satisfy this relation right and uh, or equivalently I can also write that G the dot product between G's and R is equal is a multiple of 2 pi right this is equivalent so um, we're going to use this relation this is our, this is an important relation I just remind you uh, that uh, in the book uh, the book uses uh, instead of G or GN the book uses big K of N is it another notation that most people use too many people use all right so but I mean all the lattice Bravais lattice vectors are in all the reciprocal lattice vectors G they must satisfy this relations this relation for any G for any R okay all right so another important result is the expansion of Bravais lattice vectors in terms of primitive vectors I, we, we have seen this before uh, let me add an index n to a, a Bravais lattice vector and this is n1 a1 it can be written as a linear combination of with integer coefficients n1 n2 and n3 of uh, primitive vectors a1, a2, and a3. So the ai are the so called primitive vectors of the Bravais lattice, and uh, ni are just integer integers. So this is just to say that I can construct the full Bravais lattice just by uh, doing all possible linear combinations of three non-coplanar non vectors A1, A2, A2, and A3 which are the so-called primitive vectors. This is, not, this is another way of defining the Bravais lattice. And equivalent, equivalently, we have the same definition for the reciprocal lattice because, as I said, reciprocal lattice is just a Bravais lattice in reciprocal space, right? So, but for the reciprocal lattice, a given lattice vector G of M is also a linear combination of three primitive vectors b1 b2 and b3 with integer coefficients and in this case the set of b vectors are the primitive again primitive vectors of the reciprocal lattice And once again, the set of numbers m, i are integer numbers. 
Okay. <clears throat> All right. And there's another interesting property that uh, relates the primitive vectors in real space and the primitive vectors in reciprocal space, which is this orthogonality relation. And it can be used to construct the reciprocal lattice starting from the, the real the Brevet lattice. So this orthogonality relation all, always holds for, for primitive vectors in, in real and reciprocal space. Okay? These are important relations that we are going to use throughout this chapter. All right, very good. So these are some examples of Brevet lattices in, in, in two dimensions. As we said last time, there are five different uh, Brevet lattices in, in 2D. The oblique lattice, two rectangular lattice, a primitive and a centered rectangular lattice, the square lattice and the hexagonal lattice. And these are the, all the primitive vectors A1, A2, and the corresponding reciprocal lattice vectors B1 and B2. And for instance, these are two examples for, for the um, uh, square lattice, A1 and A2, and you see that the reciprocal lattice of the square lattices is, is, is also, uh, is also, this is a square, uh, so this is also a square lattice, but in reciprocal space. And this is the oblique lattice, two primitive vectors A1 and A2. The, the, there's an arbitrary angle of theta between those two. And the, the corresponding reciprocal primitive vectors. And you can see that uh, A1, you can see that this orthogonality relation holds, right? A1 is orthogonal to B2, and B2 is orthogonal to B2. Uh, so A1 is orthogonal to B2, and A2 is orthogonal to B1, okay? <clears throat> okay, so how about group theory? So in the previous lecture, we, we discussed a general, a general form of a space group operation. A space group operation is it contain it may it may contain uh, a point group and combined with a translation operation right so in general a space group symmetry operation we wrote it like that alpha tau combining a certain point group operation that could be a rotation or a reflection or inversion or improper rotation with a certain translation that could or could not it, it may it could be a, a translation by a lattice vector or in the case of compound symmetry operations like screw axis and glide planes it could also be a translation by a vector which is in general smaller than the smallest less lattice vectors that you have okay so <clears throat> this is this is our space group and we are we have also discussed the translation subgroup which is the set of translation operators in which you don't apply any point group rotation or or reflection, but you 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 have a identity for the point group part combined with all possible translations tau, and in this case, uh, this is the trans the so-called translation subgroup. Okay, um, we know that translations commute, right? So this is, uh, we, why do we know that translations commute? Because the sum of vectors commute. 
So uh, since all translations commute, this is an abelian subgroup. The translation subgroup is an abelian. It's abelian. So the, this is the definition of abelian group that we discussed in chapter one. Okay. So what else do we know about abelian group? We know that in abelian group, and therefore also for the translation subgroup, every element is in a class by itself. Every element of the group in a class by itself. So we have as many classes as elements of the group. And in this case, we have an infinite, infinite number of elements, right? A discrete but infinite number of elements, which are precisely the translations by the infinite number of, uh, of lattice vectors, OK? So why do we know that uh, every element is in a class by itself? for an abelian group because we define the class of the element A by applying the similarity transformation using all the other elements B in the group, all possible elements B. But in this case, since all elements commute, A and, and B also commute. So I can write this as A, B, B inverse, and then this is just A. So for all possible Bs, I will always get A for this operation. So the only member of the A class is A itself. Okay, so all elements of the group are in a class by itself. As a consequence of that, we only have one-dimensional representations. Because the number of one-dimensional representations is equal to the number of classes, so, so all representations are 1D for the, uh, for the um, translation subgroup. <coughs> OK, so all representations are 1D, so the representations are just numbers, and the representations are equal to the character of the representation, right? So in this case, it's easy what to find what would the character of the translation operations would be. So how can we find the character? We apply a certain symmetry operation. In this case, is a translation operation. We apply it to a basis function. But what are the basis functions? They are precisely the blocks functions, right? Because blocks functions are the solutions of the, 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 the uh, Hamiltonian in a periodic potential they so they commute with the with the symmetry group with, with the symmetry operations of the group and therefore they can be they are basis functions of the different representations of the group so when i apply a translation to a blocks function i know from blocks theorem well i i, I get the translated wave function, but I know from Bloch's theorem, so then I use Bloch's theorem here, B, T, I know that this is just a phase e to the i k dot tau multiplied by the original wave function, right? And from this definition, I can see that this is from the, the 
remember the, the, the definitions in chapter four when we discussed the, the projection operator. I can I readily identify this as the character associated to the this particular symmetry operation and for this representation k. Okay, so in other words, using the group theory language, the phase factor that uh, is used in the definition of the blocks function is simply the character of the translation subgroup for that particular representation. Okay? So the characters are going to be um, phase factors like that. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and discuss um, another important concept of uh, group theory applied to, to, to reciprocal space, which are the, the, the group of the wave vectors and the symmetry of the wave vectors and, and the star of K. Okay, this is uh, sec section 10.3. And we start by trying to figure out what is the effect of a certain point group symmetry operation P of alpha in the the both the Bravais lattice and the reciprocal lattice. So let's suppose P of alpha is I don't know maybe a, a rotation or a reflection, and we know that since the Bravais lattice is invariant under all the point group symmetries of the space group. We know that when I apply certain symmetry operation on a certain Bravais lattice, I must recover, or I must, it, this must map the original Bravais lattice R n to another Bravais lattice R of n prime, right? This is just a, a consequence of the fact that the, the Bravais lattice is invariant under the, the, the point group operations. Okay, but however, what, so what we want to know now is what is the effect of um, applying this particular symmetry operation on the reciprocal space? We know We know that reciprocal and real space vectors must satisfy this relation in which n is an integer. But this is a number, right? And a number must be invariant over all over any symmetry operation, over any let's say rotation of the coordinate system. So this is invariant, <coughs> right? So if I apply uh, my symmetry operation both to real space and, and reciprocal space vectors, the final result must be invariant. The, the, the scalar product must be invariant, right? This should be P of alpha applied to a number which it, which remains the same number, 2 pi n. But I already discussed and, and, and uh, proposed that this is another Bravais lattice R n prime. So as a result, this must be another reciprocal lattice G of m prime in order that this relation remains valid. Okay, so as a conclusion, when we look at reciprocal space and when I apply the symmetry operations of the point group to reciprocal space vectors, it will be 
a given reciprocal space vector gm will be mapped into another reciprocal space vector g of m prime so as a conclusion uh, p of alpha is also a symmetry operation of the reciprocal lattice All right, so this is an important result. So let's go ahead, let's uh, define now the group of the wave vector that we call GK and the star of K. So by definition, the group of the wave vector is formed by the set of space group operations which transform k into itself or into an equivalent k uh, displaced by a lattice vector so in our notation this should be g in which g is a vector of reciprocal space and in fact it's a set of space group operations but uh, we can also read this as a, a point group operations because only the point group operations will matter in this case all right so let's see examples of that first let's consider uh, a particular the particular case of k equals to zero for k equals to zero we also call that the so-called gamma point so for any symmetry operation that you apply for k equals zero it remains k equals zero right it's not rotated to any other point in the in the brill one zone so uh, of course therefore all symmetry operations of the point group of the crystal will also be symmetry operations that leave k equals to zero invariant right so in this case, the group of the wave vector is precisely the same as the point group of the crystal. But this is not going to be the case for a general, in general, k for a general k different than zero. In general, the group of the wave vector will be a subgroup of the total point group of the system. And Again, let's see how this works uh, using the, an example, in this case, a 2D square lattice. So uh, before that, let me define the star of K. The star of K, it has this name because it looks like a star, as we are going to see. The star of K are all wave vectors K prime, which are mapped from k or obtained from k by applying the symmetry operations of the group the f all symmetry operations of the group and we are going to see that the two concepts star of k and the group of wave vector are very much related to each other okay as an example let's consider the the 2d square lattice the 2d square lattice has a total of eight symmetry operations so it's a group with h equals to 8. It has the identity, uh, the two C4 rotations uh, around the main symmetry axis. And C2 is a C4 square in this case. It has also two C2 prime and two C2 double prime rotations. And if you see, this is a square lattice if you in reciprocal space. So this is... Uh, kx component of the wave vector this is the ky component of the wave vector and, and let's take a general wave vector k here in the first Brill one zone right and um, first let me uh, okay so the, the 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 c2 and c4 uh, rotations are those around the main symmetry axis 
and the um, C2 prime rotations are, are those around Kx and Ky and C2 double prime are rotations around the, the diagonal axis. Okay, these are the symmetry operations of the group. All right, so if we take an arbitrary wave vector K and we apply we apply all the eight symmetry operations of the group, including the identity, then the wave vector K is mapped into this set of eight wave vectors. And this is what we call the star of K. We have eight K points in the star. Why? Right? Why? Because you start from this one, for instance. Uh, when I apply the identity, it remains here. When I apply the C2 operation, it goes right here. When I apply the 2C4 operation, it's rotated by 90 degrees, either counterclockwise or clockwise. And uh, when I rotate around the KX axis, it goes here. When I rotate around the KY, it goes right here. And when I rotate around the two diagonal axes it goes here and here so for every symmetry operation of the group the wave vector k it goes into a different wave vector k prime and this set of wave vectors is what we call the star of k okay but and then what is the group of the wave vector what is the group of this particular wave vector k so the group of the wave vector, as we have defined in the previous slide, is just the set of symmetry operations that leave K invariant, either invariant or it takes K to K plus G, right? To K plus a certain uh, reciprocal lattice vector G. But in this particular case, the only operation that does that is the identity. So the group of the wave vector in this particular case is just the identity, it has only one element. Okay? All right, so let's see how it works for a different for a different k. Let's take a certain wave vector k here which lies along the the kx axis. In this case, is, you see that you apply all the symmetry operations, you generate a star with only four elements. There are only four k's in the star. Why? Because for C2 oper C2 prime operations, k is invariant, right? So it, it stays for the it, it remains invariant, right? So for this reason, when you apply all the different operations, your star does not have eight elements, but four elements. And for the same reason, the group of wave vector, the number of elements that leave K invariant, is this one. It has two elements, the identity and the C2 prime operation. One of the C2 prime, in this case, C2 prime X. So we can see that for this particular case, there are four members in the star, and the group of the wave vector has two elements. You, you see a pattern here uh, already appearing. Uh, the number of members in the star seems to be inversely proportional to the number of to the order of the group of the wave vector. Okay, so what about this case? Let's start with this guy here. And again, this will be invariant under the C2, C2 double prime operation. And when I apply all the symmetry operations of the group, K will be mapped into only a set of four different wave vectors. So there are four wave vectors in the star. And this is the group of this wave vector. 
So these are the different possibilities for a wave vector in the interior of the Brillouin zone. But let's consider now the case in which uh, the, the wave vector is in the boundary of the Brillouin zone. And for instance, let's consider this particular case here. Let's start with this k vector. And when we apply all symmetry operations of the group, and it seems that uh, there are eight members in the star of k, but in, in reality there is only four. Why? Because actually this point in this boundary here in the right, and this other point in the left boundary, they are actually the same k point because they are related by a reciprocal lattice vector g, right? In this case, g is a reciprocal lattice. This particular g is just uh, 2 pi over a, or minus 2 pi over a x. So if you sum k with g, you get this particular k prime. So there are only the both the, the eight k points here they are actually related to each other in pairs right this one is related to that i, I can draw i can draw with uh, uh, field and open symbols just to make that clear this guy it's it's related to this one by a translation of lattice vector and this guy is the same as this. This one is the same as this. And this one in the same is the same as this. So in reality, there are only four elements in the star. And the group of the wave vector has two elements. Why? Because for both the identity and also for this C2 prime operation right here, K is mapped into either itself or into itself plus a reciprocal lattice vector G. Okay? <clears throat> so in a similar manner, in this case, there are only two members in the star. This one is equivalent to this one. And this one is equivalent to this one. And there is a total of four elements in the star in the uh, group of the wave vector and for this particular case there is just one member in the star you can see that all symmetry operations that i can apply to this wave vector k it takes k into which is in the ver ver vertex of the brillouin zone it it takes it into uh, another one of the other vertices of the Brillouin zone, and all the four vertices, they are related by translations, by uh, reciprocal lattice vectors G, okay? For the re this reason, there is only one element in the star of K, and for the same reason, the group of wave vector is the full, is the full group. It has the full, the total eight symmetry operations of the full point group of the, the square lattice. So only two points, special points that we I call R, these are special points notation, right? For the ver vertex, vertex of the real zone, it's R, for K equals zero is gamma, this is the X point, and these are lambda and S. So these are special symmetry points in which we expect that the group of the wave vector will be larger. For both the gamma point and the R point, the group of a wave vector is precisely the same as the group of the, the, the point group of the crystal. It has eight elements. For all the other element, all the other points in the Brillouin zone, it's going to be smaller than that. All right. But you can see that it's inversely proportional. So the number the number of elements in the star of 
K is essentially the, the order of the group G divided by the order of the group of the wave vector GK. Okay, so the, the two concepts are very much related. All right, very good. So let's move on. Let's see now uh, what is the effect of the translations and point group operations on blocks functions. So let's uh, start with... Um, so we know already the effect of translation, right? The effect of translations in a blocks function is just given by, by uh, the blocks theorem. It just multiplies the blocks function by a phase, the blocks phase. But then what is the effect of a point group operation in, into a blocks function? So let's take an example and let's consider uh, a certain point group operation which is in, in this case let's see a rotation R alpha so as an example just to be specific let's see let's say that the R alpha is actually uh, a pi, uh, pi over 2 rotation 90 degrees rotation of a given blocks function so let's suppose that I have a certain blocks function, which is right here. Well, to be even more simple, to be simpler than that, instead of a blocks function, let's consider a plane wave. So let's, let's apply uh, a rotation to a plane wave. And in this case, let's consider a plane wave which is initially uh, with a wave vector k along the, the x-axis, okay? So this is, in this case, k is a absolute value of k, but in the x-direction. And this is, a, this is precisely this function. This is a plane wave function, we, we, which you are very familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when I rotate this function by 90 degrees, let's say counterclockwise? So when I rotate this plane wave, I get another plane wave, but now it has a wave vector pointing in the y direction, right? So in this case, the, ro the result of applying uh, a rotation to a blocks function is, in this case, a plane wave, sorry, uh, the result of applying the a rotation to a plane wave it simply amounts to rotating the uh, the the wave vector by 90 degrees okay it was originally ar along the x direction and now it's along the y direction okay so this seems to be very uh, intuitive and and we can use that to conclude that in, in more general, in, in general, so the, the result that you, we got from plane wave is this. When I apply a rotation to a plane wave, e to the i k dot r, I get a rotated plane wave. I just rotate the wave vector k. And we can extrapolate this result to a blocks function because blocks function has a plane wave part and also the, the periodic part can also be expanded in plane waves so this is fairly reasonable I think that we can extrapolate this result to blocks function meaning that when I apply a certain point group operation, for instance a rotation or reflection, to a, a blocks function that has a, a wave vector k, the result must be another block function with a rotated wave vector r alpha k. 
So, and then I can explicitly write that as, sorry, I can explicitly write that as the plane wave part. and the periodic part so this should be the result of applying a, a rotation to a blocks function so writing this in we can say that the blocks function is mapped into another blocks function with k prime equals to or alpha k, a rotated wave vector. All right. So this is interesting because it seems that uh, in, in next lecture we're going to do that. We we can use these uh, blocks functions as basis functions for different irreducible representations of the group, and we can see that uh, when uh, we have a, a certain wave vector with the symmetry of the wave vector belonging to a certain symmetry group uh, and then uh, I, this particular point group will, may have different uh, uh, irreducible representations with different uh, uh, dimensionalities and we can use these blocks functions as wave functions of these uh, two irreducible representations. For instance, when I uh, apply certain symmetry operations and, and, and the, the blocks function is mapped into itself, then I, I can use uh, this, set of, this set of blocks functions as uh, partners of irreducible representations of the group. We're going to see that in more detail in the next lecture okay all right so we know then how uh, what is the effect of uh, uh, translation symmetry on a blocks function and now we know what is the effect of a rotation or a point group operation so then we can combine the two and answer the following question. What is the effect of a space group operation on a blocks function? And just to be simpler now, let's consider the case of symorphic groups. First. In the case of symorphic groups, we have seen in the previous lecture that I can separate or decompose a given space group operation into uh, a translation part, a pure translation, multiplied by a, a point group or operation with no translation, right? So this set this set of symmetry operations will belong to the translation subgroup T and this will belong to the point group that uh, we call G, small g, all right? <coughs> so for this case then we can ask the question uh, what happens when I apply uh, a operation of the space group into a blocks function Psi k of r, and in this case I can decompose, I can apply first 
the, the point group operation or rotation or reflection and I have done that already in the previous slide is just going to give me a rotated bo blocks function right with a rotated wave vector and now I can go ahead and apply the translation part the translation part just comes from block steering it's just going to give me phase factor and this is the final result this is the result of applying a general space group operation to a box function so how can we understand this result as you can see the blocks function is just mapped again into a, another blocks function up to a phase factor it 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 gains uh, uh sorry so this is translation vector by tau right so it's not a general r so it's a translation by tau so it gains a phase factor but up to this phase factor it's mapped into a different blocks function with a rotated k so i can draw this This is kx, this is ky, and this is my starting wave vector k. What I'm just saying, for instance, let's say it's a 90 degree rotation, so it's mapped. Very bad drawing here, but it's mapped into a k prime in which k prime is a rotated k by alpha. Okay? So, what else can we conclude? We can also conclude that these two states, they are related by uh, a symmetry operation of the group. And we know that all those symmetry operations, they commute with the Hamiltonian. So I, I know that these two blocks functions, they must have the same energy. because they are all related by symmetry operations. All block states in the star of K, they have the same energy. Uh, well, I'm assuming here that we have a single band problem, right? If we have more than one band, of course, we, we can have different solutions of the Schrodinger equation for a given wave vector corresponding to different bands, and this will give me different energies. But I'm just assuming here that I have uh, just one band and this if this is the case they have the same energy but just be careful since they belong to different uh, wave vectors uh, we don't usually say in group theory that they are degenerate we will save the term degenerate when we have uh, two electronic states with both the same energy and wave vector okay so, although they have the same energy, we don't say, in this case, that they are degenerate. Uh, we're going to use this term degenerate in a different con con context. We're going to see that in the next lecture. But they have the same energy. They are related by symmetry. And one one important uh, result of of that is uh, we don't have to solve the Schrodinger equation for all k points inside the Brillouin zone because it's just sufficient to work with a subset, a smaller portion of the Brillouin zone that we call the irreducible part of the Brillouin zone, which is not related. 
in which the wave vectors here in the irreducible part are not related by any symmetry irreducible part to any other k point in the Brillouin zone so uh, what I'm saying is that group theory uh, again saves some work uh, if we want to compute or calculate either the wave function or the energy of these uh, uh, block states because once I do that for a certain k point here inside this gray shaded area I can basically uh, obtain the wave function for all other k points which can be obtained from the irreducible part just by applying all the symmetry operations of the group for, for all those little triangles I can I have symmetry operations that take one wave vector from inside here to another wave vector in the in another triangle so I can just apply the, this rule to rotate the block states and more even more sim, simpler than that if I'm just interested in the energy I know already they are the same they have the same energy so that's the reason why in most uh, let's say band structure plots we only see the band structure calculated in a smaller portion of the Brillouin zone it's sufficient to calculate in the, in the so called irreducible irreducible part or the irreducible Brillouin zone is sufficient and uh, and that's that's why we only see and, and in fact we see the the, the band structurally band structure mostly calculated along the symmet main symmetry directions right from gamma to x to r back to gamma uh, but of course if you want the complete set of states you would have to calculate also the energy for all k points inside this irreducible part but not for all the Brillouin zone that's the that's why the, the irreducible portion of the Brillouin zone is very useful uh, a very useful concept it contains all the information about energies of the electronic states that we need for all practical purposes okay and I guess this is it for today and we continue chapter 10 in, on Wednesday and thank you for your attention